All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us in this conversation about uh, hunger and food insecurity in Connecticut and what we can do to help our constituents. Um, we have experienced in our state a global pandemic um, that has threatened our public health and we have also experienced an economic calamity and catastrophe. We have 23% of our working population uh, without work. Um, and that has uh, put a huge strain on our Department of Labor that just in uh, five weeks has processed unemployment claims, the number of unemployment claims that they would normally process over the course of three months. So this is just uh, putting a tremendous stress on our families. And even before the COVID-19 crisis came to Connecticut. We had one in nine families that were suffering from food insecurity, and we had at least one in seven children uh, that were hungry on a regular basis. And so uh, what this COVID-19 crisis has done is shown a spotlight on hunger in our uh, beautiful and uh, rich state yet a big problem that we have to address. And so we have gathered um, with uh, the help of uh, our Senator and, and Dr. Anwar, some experts to talk about uh, what policies and uh, activities we are putting into place to address this critical problem in our state. Uh, Governor Lamont has uh, directed our Commissioner of Agriculture and our Commissioner of uh, the Department of Social Services and I to work together to try to address this problem because uh, you can see it any day of the week if you go to Rensselaer Field and watch uh, Food Share and Connecticut Food Bank distribute fresh produce and food and dairy products to more than 1,500 families a day. That shows the grave need that we have in our state. Uh, we know that SNAP uh, benefit applications have quadrupled. Um, we know that uh, people are suffering from uh, job insecurity and from food insecurity. So now we're gonna hear from the people in our state who are working so hard every day to address this most fundamental issue. So um, I want to welcome uh, my friend and colleague, Senator Anwar. So nice to see you virtually. And please talk about uh, what you're doing in your district besides helping COVID-19 patients and your constituents every day to address this issue. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor Susan Bicevics, and, and thank you for your leadership. Um, as you just stated really eloquently that um, this disaster, this pandemic has uh, been impacting the health of our citizens and that's been the biggest concern. But the biggest one is the, the financial and food insecurity that uh, people who have never dreamed, never thought that they would be in this situation, they're finding themselves in this difficult position. And I'm, I'm truly honored to be in the presence of all the, the panelists today, which uh, include the Commissioner of Agriculture, Brian Herbert, and uh, uh, Commissioner of Social Services, uh, Deidre Gifford, uh, Jason uh, Jakubowski with FoodShare, and also Daniel Gomez with the Connecticut Food Bank, and uh, John Fraselini and uh, Paul Shipman was, having, I think, having difficulty joining us. But um, we have Daniel over here and Shannon Yearwood over here. Uh, what I would start off by saying is when in future we will be writing about the uh, this disaster and pandemic, the work that uh, all of the people um, on this panel, many of you, what you have been doing, will be uh, a very special part of that story because you are helping and doing some work which is truly a lifeline in the real sense for a lot of uh, the people in the community. Um, I, I have been in touch with, I'm, I'm honored to be serving uh, the, the beautiful towns of East Hartford, South Windsor, Ellington, and East Windsor. And I've been in touch with uh, the mayors and the first selectmen of, of the towns, uh, Marsha Leclerc, um, and she's been active and, and she uh, is there 
every day essentially to be able to um, be at the Rensselaer Field with where uh, Jason, you and your team are doing God's work. And I, I uh, think um, uh, I, the community, all the regional towns are benefiting from that automatically or the communities are going there. Uh, I know uh, Mayor Andrew Paterna, who's uh, listening to as uh, he was going to join, um, he's uh, working to to make sure that uh, with all the three groups, we are providing some food and support to the people as well. I've been in touch with Jason Bauza, uh, as well as uh, 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 Laurie Spielman uh, with Ellington, and, and uh, they are very much involved in the community and in working very closely. I can tell you what's happening is uh, uh, right now in my interactions with the community, uh, there are uh, people who obviously have changes in their lives right now with the furloughs and the job losses, um, the inoperability of businesses that are there, the lack of savings. You know, people do not have more than two weeks of savings. And then here we are in the sixth week of this, uh, we are people who are struggling. And then despite the Department of Labor's work, um, not money has not reached the pockets of many of the people. And this is actually causing the insecurity that they were never able to uh, plan. And poor health is another issue. The fear of going out is a difficulty for a number of people, lack of transportation, uh, and then those are adding up to the true real food insecurity that uh, we are seeing in the community. I'll share a, a brief uh, uh, story of a patient of mine um, that I was talking to. She actually thankfully has recovered from COVID and she's at home. She's healthy. She's been healthy before this infection. Uh, but now she's on oxygen and she can barely move too much. And as, as I was doing a telehealth visit and talking to her, I said, how are you getting your food? And, and in her situation, Situation. This is a person who was independent completely, but because of her health, and then we will see more of this, is she's unable to go out. She's oxygen dependent right now and then is very weak. Thankfully, one of her neighbors came in and helped her out and the neighbor is getting her the groceries. But not everybody's neighbor is as available. Not everybody community is not uh, as, as accessibility. So we are seeing things that we had not imagined or heard of. And, and that's part of uh, what we are seeing in the real sense. And, and I'm, I'm interacting with some of the people and, and, and looking at the real work that is being done by the people. Um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the virus is strong, but our community is stronger. And, and the work that all of you are doing by putting all hands on deck on all different parts uh, between the Department of Social Services, Department of Agriculture, um, uh, Connecticut Food Bank and, and Food Share, what you're trying to and you've been able to do is to help the people in a very critical time. I'm honored to be part of uh, the hunger action teams uh, uh, and, and uh, for South Windsor, I'm one of the founders for that and I'm part of East uh, Hartford's uh, hunger action team as well. And, and the hunger, hunger action team in East Windsor is very vibrant. They're doing good work as well. And, and there are food banks in, in Ellington that are, that are doing good work. There is an uptick in the need for sure. And, and uh, that's why we have to check on our neighbors. That's going to be our lifeline. Finally, I'll just end. Uh, this is the month of Ramadan for me. I'm, I'm fasting at this time. So about 18 hours of the day, I don't eat or drink anything. But that's why you, you, you're you supposed to feel how people are feeling and experience it. But I'm fortunate that after the 18 hours, I'm able to eat. And then many people in our communities are actually having those struggles. So um, again, thank you, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, for your leadership, and, and thank you for everybody who's over here. I look forward to conversations and discussions with everyone later uh, in, in this conversation today. Thank you. Senator, uh, thank you so much for representing your constituents. And Dr. Anwar, thank you for taking care of COVID patients. We're, we're so grateful for your work. And you have hit upon many of the different areas that I think our speakers are going to be talking about. Um, how do we make sure that uh, families uh, that need food, especially children, get the food that they need? Uh, what about the older, sicker, vulnerable people who need either shopping or delivery services? How do we connect them? And we're also going to be talking about how people can get the access to mental health uh, care and other critical services um, that they need. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, we're so happy to have our agriculture commissioner here. Um, commissioner Herbert, thank you for joining us. And um, you will be followed by Commissioner Deidre Giffords. We're so honored that both of you are here. Commissioner, talk about uh, what you are doing to address 
of food insecurity issues and feed hungry people in our state and talk about your work with um, our incredible farmers in Connecticut as well. It's gonna help if I unmute myself, right? Yes. Don't worry, I didn't say anything that important yet. Um, but uh, no, thank, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Senator Anwar, um, for convening this. Um, Senator, the efforts that you talked about in your, in your communities are the similar efforts that we're seeing here today with um, the State Department of Education, Department of Social Services, the Department of Agriculture, the Lieutenant Governor, and a member of the legislature all coming together to make sure that um, across our different agencies, um, we are working to provide for our communities and add in the efforts of Food Bank and Food Share in a non-governmental aspect. It really shows the all hands on deck that we are, uh, the approach that we're taking. Um, and a special thank you to all the folks that have donated time, money, and food um, to the effort that ensure their neighbors have access to food during uh, this crisis. I was on the phone with members of the Salvation Army earlier today, and um, they mentioned how some of their previous donors are now coming in for pickups um, and how disruptive COVID-19 has been uh, across the state. Um, so we're looking at segmenting the work um, into four different buckets, food insecurity, food systems, food distribution, food av availability. Um, and I'll just briefly run through these because I know we've got a great panel. Um, currently, we're, getting, we're scanning all of the efforts because as we know, there's a lot of different organizations um, and efforts all working together or, or going in the same direction um, to provide and meet this need. What we're trying to do from the um, Department of Agriculture perspective is make sure that we're all rowing together at the same time, that the efforts are aligned, that we're collaborating. Um, because there's so much great work going on, we just have to make sure that it's facilitated in a way that makes sure that it's extended as far as it can go. Um, and so in one of those efforts, I just wanna uh, point out to you, Senator uh, Manili's in South Windsor um, reached out to me and said, how can I help? What can I do? Bruce said, if you, what, what do you need? And, um, and I said, well, you know, we've, we've got a problem with the refrigeration and Lieutenant Governor and I were at Wrench the Field last week and, um, Jason had mentioned one of his uh, refrigerated trailers had gone down. Um, through Bruce's efforts, um, a, another trailer will be arriving today so that Jason and his team and his volunteers can continue providing uh, the refrigerated foods for the families that are coming through there. Um, so really, really important. We're working with DSS on rolling out mobile EBT readers, um, finding ways uh, to uh, get more foods into the hands of the people who are at home, um, but also more food access to people who are on SNAP or who are facing food insecurity. Um, we think that this effort, um, mobile, the mobile EBT readers at farm stands, farmers markets, and farm stores will essentially double the amount of uh, opportunity for people on SNAP to use their benefits at local farms, um, which is critically important, especially as we talk about um, rolling into the farmers market season Many of our farmers markets that accept SNAP uh, benefits are in urban areas. And so this extends their ability to purchase fresh local food um, for their families. And many of those urban markets do SNAP doubling programs, thereby doubling the purchasing power that um, these families have. So that is a huge effort. Um, uh, Commissioner Gifford and I were uh, just on the phone a short while ago talking about aligning our efforts for FEMA. Um, how can we um, get food delivered to those at home, just like the story you um, mentioned earlier, Senator. FEMA will give us a 75% coverage um, for the cost of that food. Um, we have to figure out the next 25% and we can be pretty creative on how we do that. So that will be rolling out in the near future. Um, we're in regular communication with the Connecticut Food Association. Um, the executive director was telling me last week that um, on the meat situation that a lot of people have been reading about, that the grocery stores are, are seeing about a 70% of their normal supply, which in a normal time wouldn't be a problem, but are facing 130% demand. So there's a huge increase in demand versus uh, a slight decrease 
and the supply available, which may create gaps at the grocery stores. And we're working with them to ensure um, that those gaps are as small as possible and are not across an entire protein line, but maybe across different cuts of meats. Um, President Trump's executive order last week may help. Um, that's really yet to be seen. Um, but we are trying to make sure that um, people have food wherever they are, whether they be at their house or able to go out, whether they are food insecure or, or on SNAP um, or have the ability to pay. We want to make sure that people make the best decision and have a, a system around them to allow for the best decision to get the access to food where they need it, when they need it. Um, and with that, Lieutenant Governor, I'll, uh, I'll pause here because I know we've got a lot of other great um, presenters here and be available for questions at the end. Thank you so much, Commissioner, uh, for all the great work uh, that you're doing. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Deidre Giffords, who has been doing uh, great work in our state and uh, working very hard along with our congressional delegation to increase SNAP benefits for our residents and also work on some of the EBT issues that you mentioned, Commissioner Holbert. So uh, Deidre, uh, Commissioner, please talk about uh, what your office is doing and your work with um, the food security group, please. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you very much for having us. Happy to be able to participate with sound this time. And we can see you too, this it, is you great. Can, <laughs> you can see me and hear me, it's a miracle. Uh, thank you very much for including DSS. Senator An Anwar, thank you very much for uh, your comments and for your work. Um, it's so important that the two of you continue to keep this um, issue on the front burner and front and center. And uh, so we're very grateful. And I'm also delighted to be uh, with my partner, uh, Commissioner Hurlbert, working on food. And um, the, I think it's a great uh, partnership between DSS and the Department of Agriculture. And uh, there's a lot that we can do together to continue building on the work that's happened over the past eight weeks or so as part of our um, unified command and emergency support functions at the state. As you mentioned, uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, we at DSS, and I'm joined by our SNAP Director, Dan Giacomi, who uh, is the expert on all details with respect to SNAP, but we have been working very hard to uh, do a few things. One is to make it as easy as possible for individuals to apply for SNAP benefits if uh, they think they may be eligible or if they're experiencing food insecurity. So people can continue to go to ct.gov slash DSS. Uh, follow the path there to apply for SNAP benefits. Um, we are fully up and running in our benefit centers through the Department of Social Services. Um, and uh, uh, emergency SNAP benefits can be um, approved within a few days and regular SNAP benefits can be approved um, in a week to 10 days. So we're, uh, we're fully operational, uh, working remotely. And so um, uh, we're making it as easy as we can for people to apply. In addition to that, we've been able to, through waivers with our federal partners, increase the amount of SNAP benefits that families are receiving. So every, every family that receives SNAP is now getting the maximum benefit. Um, that's brought about 30 million additional dollars to families on their cards um, in the month of April, and we'll have another increase issued in May. Um, so that's a direct cash uh, uh, for buying food um, that we hope is easing the burden for some of the families uh, who receive SNAP benefits. Um, as you uh, also know, we're working very hard on allowing SNAP benefits to be used for um, delivery. That's not been something that's been available in Connecticut, um, but to the point that you were making earlier, Senator, about um, individuals obviously not being able to leave their homes, uh, we wanna be sure that people can use their EBT cards to purchase food and have it delivered. And so um, we're aiming for the end of this month to have that uh, benefit available. We also were just approved for a new program, the so-called Pandemic EBT, which will allow us to issue new benefit cards to families of children 
in communities where a large percentage receive free and reduced price lunch. Um, there's no application process required for that benefit. Um, and it'll be about, and Dan will correct me, but I think with the announcement today of school closure through the end of the year, about $90 million in PEBT benefits that we'll be able to issue to families. So that's uh, a, a huge dent um, that we hope will, uh, will help families who are experiencing food insecurity be able to, uh, to buy food using their, these new cards. And finally, I just want to talk about the future. Um, Commissioner Hurlburt mentioned the work that we're doing um, with FEMA to think about how to support people going forward. And this is directly related, Senator, to your comment about um, the individual who's at home because of her illness. We're very aware that there are going to be people over the next uh, weeks and months who will not be able to leave their homes to purchase food. Um, and uh, we'll want them to stay home because they've either got a COVID infection or they've been exposed to someone who we know has a COVID infection. So we're working very hard with all of our partners, uh, local, regional, and state on finding ways that we can uh, make sure that when there is a gap, we won't be able to, to have meals delivered to everybody, but when there is a gap and someone's not able to get uh, food, that we're able to connect them with a resource, a local resource to do that. So that's the work that's before us right now, partnering with DPH and the Reopen Connecticut Committee to make sure that we're identifying those populations and setting up a structure by which they can uh, receive food at home. Um, I'll stop there. Again, thank you for having DSS uh, participate today. We're delighted to be here and, uh, and here to answer questions later if people have them. And thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Now we're gonna go uh, to the uh, two uh, people who've been leading Herculean efforts across the state. Um, and uh, by that, I mean uh, Jason Jakubowski, first from FoodShare, and then we're going to hear from Daniel Gomes, the CEO of Connecticut Food Bank. Both of these organizations have been uh, collecting and distributing food uh, to food pantries um, in almost every town in the state and also making direct visits to not just Rensselaer Field, but also to delivery spots around the state, uh, particularly in urban areas where the need is great. So Jason Jakubowski, thank you so much for all the great work you're doing. Can you tell us, uh, please, what Food Share is doing across the state? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I appreciate you having uh, having us, us on. And uh, you, you've done a, a great job handing out potatoes over there at Rentschler Field. I know uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor grew up on a potato farm and, and was, was complaining that they were only five pound bags of potatoes and said she could very easily carry 50 pound bag of bags of potatoes. Indeed. We'll get we'll get bigger ones for you next time. And there Senator you. Anwar, again, it's it's always a privilege to 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 work with you. Uh, Senator Anwar doesn't just talk the talk, he, he walks the walk. He's been a part of our hunger action team for, uh, for quite a long time and is always out there supporting us and in, in, in doing what he can. You haven't lived until you've been to a turkey drive when, when he's standing on top of a, a mound of frozen turkeys in a suit and tie. It's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty impressive, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty impressive image. Um, and of course, we're in the presence of greatness with the with the food czar, my friend uh, Brian Herbert. And we we do Brian, we do appreciate that uh, the 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 trailer and the way that we work together. I think one thing, looking at all of these panelists, we've all worked together very well over the last um, six seven weeks, however long this is this is is lasted. Um, and I think that's something that's going to have to continue in order for in order for uh, the state to have a comprehensive. Uh, solution to, to all of this. So for my friends at, at SDE, to DSS, and, and of course to, to, to Dan and, and, and his whole crew at Connecticut Food Bank, I mean, I don't, I don't think any of us could do this alone. I think the only way we're able to do this is, is together. Um, I will uh, say, you know, again, you, you alluded to the, uh, to the distribution we've been doing at Rentschler Field. Uh, we are in week three. I was actually there this morning. We had a number of our uh, UConn athletic coaches were there helping out, handing out some uh, some material, uh, some uh, food. 
cars are getting about 20, uh, maybe a little more than 20 pounds of food a day as they, uh, as they come through. We've seen more than 15,000 cars and 15,000 households come through there. We're doing about 14, 1,500 uh, a day and doing more than 100,000 pounds a, a, a week. We did a survey on those uh, individuals and we found that about 70 to 75% of them are new to food insecurity. They were just perfectly, perfectly uh, employed four or five weeks ago and through no fault of their own have found themselves without a, uh, without a job and wondering where their next meal is coming from. Um, so we're glad we've been able to set up that drive-through distribution in order to be able to help uh, that folks who are new to the to the system. But I think the the important thing to remember is that that is only and, and I know it gets a lot of media attention, but it is only a supplement to our our regular program. Um, and I, I I know Dan's been doing the same thing down in in uh, with Connecticut Food Bank. Our mobile sites are still out there uh, in the neighborhoods. Uh, we still have uh, uh, hundreds of of partner agencies that we. Are, are giving food to on a, uh, on a daily, sometimes weekly uh, basis. Uh, we are, we're out there. And uh, what we have seen over the last couple of weeks is that the need has increased dramatically. So as a food bank, uh, I've said this before, we are not in the business of purchasing food. That's generally not what we do. Um, and you've seen all 200 food banks in America suddenly need to, need to purchase food in order to make, uh, uh, in order to make ends meet given all the increases that we've been seeing from our, our pantries. Our pantries have uh, been getting about 30%, uh, a 30% increase in terms of the amount of food that they have been seeing. Uh, our mobile sites have been getting different uh, uh, customers than what they normally have seen. And again, that's all on top of the 100,000 pounds a week that we're doing over at, uh, at Rentschler Field. So the need has definitely increased. The cost has definitely increased. We have never spent this much money before. Um, Thankfully, uh, we live in a very generous state in a very generous community, and uh, we have benefited from a, a number of different monetary um, donations from, uh, from, from 4CT and the Dalio Foundation to corporations to individuals, and that's been able to sustain us. So um, we plan to keep doing what we're doing uh, through the, uh, the duration of this crisis, but I think we know and again, Dan can, can talk more about that. If, if you want. Th this isn't going to end once the coronavirus itself has been solved. The impact on food banks is going to be long lasting. Thank you very much, um, Jason. And before we turn it over to Daniel Gomez of the Connecticut Food Bank, can you tell us, you just said through the duration, because one of the questions that we've been getting um, from folks who are on the line with us, including media, is, do you know how long you can stay at Rentschler Field um, giving out food? Well, as long as you let us, Lieutenant Governor. I mean, that, that's fine. No, they, they, oh, they, yeah, the governor, if you have food to give out, I think the governor and I are good to let yeah. you keep doing it. I will tell you, we, we are technically announced through this Friday, but I would, I would advise all uh, media and anybody uh, uh, listening that we'll be making an announcement tomorrow about uh, extending beyond uh, – beyond this Friday. We will we'll be there as long as there's a need, as long as we have the food, the volunteers, and again, as long as you and the governor will let us uh, use the uh, the property, this very generous donation from the state and from CRDA. It is, it, I will just say on behalf of the governor and I, it's been an amazing uh, sight to behold. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the equivalent of the bread lines that, that my grandparents talked about in the, in the 1930s. Um, Daniel Gomez, thank you so much for everything that you're doing at the Connecticut Food Bank. Can you talk about uh, what you've been seeing during the past a couple of months and um, talk about some of the new things that you're doing? Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz and uh, Senator Anwar, and always, uh, Brian, appreciate your leadership. I know we've had a number of discussions over the last many weeks, and so... <clears throat> It's hard to believe that uh, we were just talking about COVID-19 some eight weeks ago, right? Uh, similar story to what Jason was or explaining. And, you know, Jason uh, and I stay in touch on a regular basis, the two food banks, understanding how we support the community at large. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, what we've been seeing is a similar story, though a little bit different. Uh, servicing six counties in the state of Connecticut gives us a very wide lens. Um, and as an example, just this month of April, we delivered over 2.1 million pounds to those six counties. 
And although we did that through our member agencies, we also had mobile pantries. And we don't get a lot of those discussions because, uh, Lieutenant Governor, you mentioned those rural areas. And we conducted 28 individual mobile sites in those rural areas, like the Litchfields and the Wyndham counties and so on. Many of those areas still have a, a serious uh, problem with food insecurities. Um, the numbers we're seeing there are very similar to what Jason discussed. We had doubled in size. Some of those mobile pantries would be upwards of 150, 200 people were seeing very easily double that on a consistent basis. So we conducted 28 of those along with we took over 21,000 miles uh, this last month, uh, making almost 600 individual deliveries to our pantries, which is really kind of the Connecticut Food Bank's core mission. Uh, we're in the very small communities at large, along with the bigger cities. And so when you talk about the Fairfields and the New Londons and the New Havens, right, it takes a, a pretty large logistical force to get those individual deliveries into those communities. And we're very fortunate that we have a very supportive staff. We've been reporting 100% attendance since it started uh, back in early March. So we've been very grateful for that. And then similar to Jason, you know, over the last several weeks, there's been a lot of discussion about limits on foods and can we sustain this and what can we do to improve the situation? And again, a very similar story. We've been very, very, uh, I guess, grateful and, uh, so, and happy to see the support we've received from so many donors. That's allowed us to increase our food spend. And as I think I reported in the previous call, we spent in the month, two weeks, first two weeks of April, more than we spent in the entirety of 2019 on food purchases. And so again, uh, luckily through our generous donors, we believe that for the foreseeable two to three months, we could sustain that. But obviously, uh, you know, that money would have to continue to come in to support that. Um, we're doing a couple of different things. And so although our food sourcing is starting to pick up and we're qu quite happy about that, but it's not at the pace that we'd feel comfortable. Uh, we know that food insecurity is going to continue to grow. And as we've seen those lags in the Department of Labor reporting on unemployment, we're seeing that show up in our mobile pantries along with our agency uh, households being served. Our local agencies had operated in the mid-90 percentile throughout the month of April, and they're seeing a 40 to 50 percent increase in foot traffic. Much of that 40 to 50 percent increase are first-time individuals and families. And, and that's overwhelming to our pantry. So it's important for us to be able to sustain and replenish their on-hand available inventory, which also means we have to increase the frequency of the delivery to keep those local pantries and soup kitchens uh, and missions staffed and supported. Another thing that we're gonna be doing very shortly, and I think uh, it's been probably widely communicated, but uh, we have 28 mobile pantries that we conduct almost monthly. We'll be doing that again in the month of May. That will continue. Um, at the same time, because our food uh, purchases and procurement have started to roll in uh, as those lead times have kind of gotten smaller, we're able to actually support some other larger mobile drive throughs And you're going to be hearing an announcement in the next 24 hours that we will conduct several of those over the next few weeks in Fairfield County. That's in conjunction with the 28 individual mobile sites that we will continue with throughout the month of May and forward. Um, but again, that's also in concert with our almost 600 pantries that we deliver to day in and day out. So again, that six county area, we've gotten a pretty good sense that it's a 40 to 50% increase almost across the board. Uh, but at the same time, we're going to try to supplement that with some of the local support. And I, and I have to give a shout out to the Mayor of Bridgeport, uh, along with um, uh, Norwalk, they were very helpful in helping us coordinate uh, a large mobile drive through that we will announce in the next 24 to 48 hours. Thank you so much. We're going to stop you right there. And our final speaker, who we're going to ask to be extremely brief, only because uh, we know we have some members of the media and lots of questions, and we want to get a chance to address those. Uh, Paul Shipman. You are also representing uh, the Connecticut Food Bank. Thank you for everything you're doing. And we're going to go to Shannon Yearwood for uh, a minute or so on what you're doing at the Department of Education. Thank you so much. Always an honor to be on with the panel of champions. So one, I just want to recognize that May 1st was National School Lunch Hero Day, and they truly, truly deserve that recognition this year. We have seen schools step up to the plate like in no other way. 
Um, we are at about 4 million meals have been served since mid-March, which is unprecedented considering that they had to overnight move everything from the cafeteria to be able to distribute on an individual basis. We've uh, worked very closely with the United States Department of Agriculture to be able to provide several flexibilities that allow them to do multiple day distributions at a time so they could on Monday serve breakfast and lunch that would last um, for Monday and Tuesday so that they can continue to implement those social distancing measures and keep folks as safe as they can. We've also been able to allow them to now not have to individually unitize meals, but provide them in bulk components, which makes it a little easier at, in the household level to be able to store rather than a whole bunch of different individual containers. Helps on the, on the supply side, it helps on the storage side, and it really makes sure that people have the food they need throughout the week to be able to uh, make ends meet and make sure that their kids are served. So we have 458 sites across Connecticut 392 of those we've been able to make community-wide, which means any kid 18 and younger is able to get food up at those sites. We've allowed parents and guardians to pick them up without needing the physical presence of the child, also unprecedented in the federal nutrition programs. Um, we know that we work very closely with the Office of Early Childhood, and we've been, as of the data they were able to supply us on April 21st, we knew at that point that the at least 54,990 children had the, who were attending closed child care centers had the ability to get food from their school areas at those community-wide sites. Since then, we've, we've converted an additional 15 towns, so we're able to really see more, um, more kids being served regardless of their school age or younger. We have 82 different sites who are able to do at-risk after-school meals, so they're able to provide up to three meals and a snack per day. Um, per those distributions. And we have 12 child care centers that are closed but still committed to serving um, kids that food that's developmentally age appropriate. 31% of our house of our of our schools and sponsors have figured out how to do a household delivery, which is pretty amazing. Completely unprecedented in the school meals world. Um, and nine, at least 9% are using bus stop routes as their um, drop points. So the the only other thing that um, with the closing of schools, we've been able to get um, approval from USDA to allow these modes of operation through the end of June, regardless of previously scheduled school closures. I also wanna give a huge shout out to our partners over at Department of Social Services. We've been working very closely on the pandemic EBT and we're really thrilled that that will go out as a complement to the other food that folks are able to get through those school meals. So. It's um, a, lot of, a lot of behind the scenes happens to make this work. And I'm really excited to see that families will be able to benefit from that as well. Great, thank you so much, uh, Shannon. And just a shout out to uh, Dan, Dan Giacomi, who's the SNAP coordinator at, DAS, at DSS, excuse me. Um, there's a lot of alphabets with us today. Uh, from Dan is from DSS and he's the SNAP coordinator and we really appreciate his participation. So. Uh, one of the questions that NBC Connecticut had for us was, what is the state of Connecticut uh, doing and what are we seeing? And I think each of us talked about what we're hearing from our constituents and what we are seeing across the state. We know that thousands of families across the state are making uh, use of the grab-and-go lunches that are being provided by our school districts. We know that we've seen between a 40 to 50 percent increase in um, traffic, foot traffic, and uh, people showing up at uh, food pantries. And we, know, and we know that we have been seeing many more people uh, come forward at delivery sites um, that food share makes and including uh, the huge uh, outpouring uh, of need that we've seen at Rentschler Field. And we think a lot of this has to do with um, the record number of unemployed people um, that we have in our state. We have a 23% uh, unemployment rate, which has made the SNAP benefits offered uh, both uh, through the State Department of Social Services and through the federal government um, really, really important. Um, the Department of Social Services is going to be, be providing $15.4 million in uh, SNAP benefits 
to nearly half of the SNAP participants on Friday, May 8th. Um, and that adds to the already the $32.7 million in emergency benefits that were dispersed in April. So you can see that there is a lot of uh, need out there um, that nearly 100,000 of the 212,000 SNAP households um, in our state are getting emergency benefits in May. And we appreciate the work that the federal government has done of recognizing that we need more uh, emergency uh, benefits. And the state has been uh, very um, closely working with our farmers and we appreciate um, the outreach that uh, Brian Hurlbert has done to make sure that some of the dumping of agricultural products that we've seen in other states does not happen here in Connecticut. Um, if we have a surplus of milk and dairy products, which we do because of school closures and because of uh, restaurants uh, not being open, we wanna make sure that that food gets delivered to people who need it. So um, the governor and I appreciate the work that the commissioner has done um, in that regard, because that's uh, really, really um, important. So one of the questions that we also have um, is this, how do we make sure that families uh, who are coming forward and getting food um, at some of the sites we've been talking about also get other things that they might need like diapers, formula, clothing, mental health support, access to other services. Um, Commissioner Gifford, do you wanna talk about that or any of our panelists can, can jump in on that one? Um, so, uh, excellent question. Um, and certainly those, uh, there are avenues and resources for all of those things that you're talking about, Lieutenant Governor. Um, and I think some of the work that we are thinking about doing going forward to, uh, to wrap around individuals who are showing up um, uh, expressing need for our recovery efforts will in fact address those things. So we know that DCF, for example, has set up a new hotline for families that are struggling uh, just to, to talk through issues and concerns. Uh, and we are certainly um, seeing more people applying for healthcare benefits through Access Health, um, a big jump in people who have applied for and received Husky, um, and, as well as uh, you know, our usual cash benefit programs. I would um, welcome uh, Jason or one of the Dans um, to speak a little bit more about how um, those uh, it, you know, services are integrated at the sites where people are coming forward uh, uh, to, re to receive food. Yeah, I can, I can tell you, Commissioner, that one of the, the, the things that we've been doing uh, uh, at the Rentschler Field site, for example, is distributing material about our, our regular mobile programs, our texting program. I know we're working with the Department of Consumer Protection to hand out some uh, additional material regarding, you know, uh, 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 anti-fraud programs and, and other such things. Many of our pantries too, not all of them, but many of our pantries do deal with other services and other products other than just uh, other than just food. So while we we typically just distribute food, uh, a lot of the agencies that we uh, that we work with uh, absolutely have a um, uh, many wraparound services that uh, that I think our our clients can take advantage of. And and I'll also add uh, before we go to the Dan's that. Uh, a lot of the school districts that have grab-and-go meals uh, for families to pick up have uh, school administrators and professionals there who can help families deal with all kinds of uh, social service um, issues. So does one of the Dans want to want to chime in here? Maybe not. Okay, so we've had a question uh, from Sarah Egan of the State of Connecticut's uh, Child Advocate. Uh, and uh, Sarah is asking, what about pregnant women? 
um, with infants uh, or, or women with infants? How do they make sure um, that uh, they get access to the nutrition programs um, that they need? They can be in touch with uh, DSS um, and they can also be in touch uh, with their uh, local social services department at their city or town level. And Sarah, if you're interested, if you are not already part of the uh, Council on Women and Girls, you ought to be because we are doing all kinds of things uh, to make sure um, that women and uh, children are protected. So uh, you should be on our council, part of our council, um, if you are not already. Um, we have another uh, question, uh, which I think should be directed to um, the Commissioner of Agriculture and possibly the food banks. Um, so the question is, Commissioner, people are asking about the food pipeline. What do you see um, about the state's access uh, to food, particularly for distribution to people who need it? Do you see any uh, log jams, um, any shortages in the future? What do you see there? And then we'll also see what the food banks have to say about that as well. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for the question and uh, whoever asked it. It's, it's a critically important question as we discuss our food supply chain. And over the past couple of weeks, we heard um, in reports of a number of meat packing um, plants that were planning on closing um, due to uh, COVID sicknesses in on their line workers. The president signed an executive order um, designating those folks as essential uh, workforce employees, um, allowing them to come to work if they are sick. Uh, I'm not sure that that is the best tool that he could have used, um, but it is a way to make sure that our food supply infrastructure um, remains intact. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to see um, a decrease in the, in the cuts of meat, um, but not necessarily a, a, a complete shortage um, or an empty grocery shelf um, in the, with your proteins, your chickens, your porks, and your beets. Um, I think the, the wholesale and industrial or institutional um, supply chain has started their pivot from um, providing institutions, uh, hotels, restaurants, schools, um, to better able supply of the retail demand. Um, and so there, I think that that supply chain is coming back. There was a blip, I think, towards the end of um, uh, or a return to normalcy. I don't know that there will be an end, um, but uh, we'll see another blip as, as those um, institutional packagers move back towards larger sizes. Um, one of the things we're, we're working with and, and having in touch with uh, Dan uh, Gomez and Jason at FoodShare is how can we support uh, the purchasing? Is there a way for us to um, coordinate that effort so that um, food pantries and food banks are getting the amount of food they need. Um, the Farms to Families Food Box Program will be announced later this week. We had um, a number of organizations in Connecticut, farmers um, and other wholesalers uh, and distributors um, apply uh, for that project. USDA announced it two weeks ago. Um, last week was the application deadline and they've committed to uh, announcing awards this Friday. So. Um, I think the, the food chain will be different, but I do believe that there is enough food coming through. It just may not be in the same package or unit size that you had seen uh, previously. And I'll turn it to Dan or Jason for, for any additional comments they have. Sure, Brian, I've got a couple of comments. And so, you know, we've had a lot of different discussions and I can tell you that we're actually starting to see a moderate improvement in our food procurement. And so uh, I think over three to four weeks back, we knew that it was a very slow road. Most of the lead times were uh, all the way back into late May, early June at the earliest. We're now starting to see some easing of that and availability. Uh, the one difference is, is the price is a little bit um, higher than what we had anticipated seeing increases with. But the good news for us is we've actually been able to outpace our distribution on our food procurement over the last week and a half. And that's the first time for us in eight weeks since this all began. So. That's why I say that the pain is easing just a little bit. We do see that there are some commodities that they're um, 
limitations of. You mentioned one on the meat and the protein side of availability. It is kind of hand to mouth with that. Uh, and so we're trying to source I additional locations where we might be able to bring that food in well outside the boundaries of the north northeast and new england and so forth there seems to be some availability but it does come at a much higher cost uh, but those other things that we talked about as kind of the staple items when you talk about pastas rice soups uh, canned vegetables uh, along with peanut butter and so forth those still uh, seem to garner some um, higher commodity type pricing than what we experienced in the past, but we are able to source it. Uh, it's just at a higher price. The one thing that is still the bright spot for us on a procurement side is the fresh produce. It is bountiful. We've had quite a bit of it and we don't foresee any concerns there with the food chain. I, I agree with everything Dan, uh, with, with everything Dan said, uh, produce has been in abundance. We've had no problem being able to procure produce. We're expecting the next couple of weeks to be difficult with regard to meat. Those shelf-stable products are still very difficult to come by um, and also are, are increasingly expensive. The bottom line is I, I don't lose sleep over the supply chain. I'm more concerned about the, the, the demand side of the equation and how long uh, this is going to, uh, how long this is going to last and how long, you know, th these, these artificial, so these these unusual highs in terms of demand are going to are going to maintain. That's that's what I think the biggest the biggest question is. So the um, one of the last questions I think we have time for is um, we are getting questions about the availability of shopping and delivery services, uh, particularly for um, seniors and low income folks who aren't able to go to the grocery store and for people who couldn't um, maybe afford the delivery fee. Um, Deidre, can you talk about that or anybody else who, who wants to uh, speak about that? So um, again, uh, Lieutenant Governor, I think that this is a, an issue that we, uh, Commissioner Hurlburt, myself, the Unified Command, and a, a multi-agency work group are tackling in terms of um, the very clear understanding that we need to make sure that people who are, need to be isolated at home for the duration of this pandemic can access those services that they need. Um, I would ask uh, Dan G if there's anything on the um, the food, the SNAP related food delivery. I believe, uh, and Dan will correct me, that um, the retailers who agree to that program will, there'll be some agreement about the, the delivery fee for SNAP uh, recipients um, so that uh, that won't be a barrier. Um, but Dan, do we have any details yet about um, the delivery fees when, when we are able to do SNAP home uh, grocery delivery? Yeah, um, I think Commissioner, we're having problems getting his sound access. You have, you have uh, overcome those and now, unfortunately, <laughs> they, they're- <laughs> I transferred them. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor, we, we will confirm my response and get that back to uh, the participants in this call. Okay. I would also uh, suggest people call 211. Uh, there's a lot of local organizations that have set up um, delivery services. And Shannon mentioned earlier um, that some schools are, are putting this together. I know in New Haven, they're about to roll out a, a program. Um, and so, you know, th there are some programs on a, on a really local level that people may be able to take, a, take advantage of. And they should go through 211. Commissioner, and I appreciate that. Um, the other thing I would say is that I know a lot of senior centers uh, across the state are doing wellness checks uh, with seniors in their city or town and have a volunteer structure in place to deliver uh, meals and deliver um, grocery items to those seniors. Uh, and further, we have, the state of Connecticut has been soliciting uh, volunteers to come forward um, Lisa Tepper Bates has been involved in doing that and we've already put um, more than three or four hundred volunteers to work but we've had um, several thousand uh, people volunteer to 
um, to give their time. And so that may be an area where um, we will utilize um, those wonderful people who have come forward uh, to volunteer. So we want to say thank you to all of our experts. Um, we've tried to get to as many of the uh, media questions as we could. Um, if any of the media continue to have questions, if, if our experts uh, did not answer them, they can, you can feel free to reach out to our office or to um, any of our participants um, who will get back to you if you uh, need any of those uh, answered further. But we appreciate uh, everybody. Senator Anwar, thank you so much for uh, joining us today for all the great work that you're doing. And thank you to all of our participants. Um, we will see you virtually very soon, I am sure. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, thank you so much.